Good morning, everybody. It is man coverage. It is September 4th, 2022. This is Knoxville Nate and James Bonneville coming to you live, talking some college football. And boy, did we get some college football. James, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm tired. I definitely can tell I'm like not in game form <laughs> as much football as I've watched over the past three days. Um, and we still got more football. We still got a game tonight and a game on Monday night. That's the one thing I love about this holiday is five straight days of football. And hopefully by week two, I'll feel like I'm in, I'm in game shape there, but uh, yeah, I'm a little tired right now. Yeah. You look a little rough, but that's good. That's good. Yeah, that, yeah. Means you're doing, that means you're doing your job and watching the games. Yeah. I love this new format uh, with the Labor Day start. And games starting on Thursday. I went to a game on Thursday night and watched the local squad here uh, play against Ball State and got a little taste of college football. And then we had uh, games on Friday night and we had games on Saturday and then we got games tonight and we got games tomorrow. So, uh, you know, I can't I can't complain. I, any college football is good for me and having been off of our college football uh, serving for a while, it's it's good to finally get it back, and and it, it came back, man. We had some great games yesterday, and some games that came down to the wire, and and we got to get a look at every team uh, that that played so far, and it was uh, pretty interesting. I I want to start off um, talking about the the teams and the players that kind of stood out to us, and before we get into, we're going to break down every single game. We're obviously going to get into heavy. Uh, breakdown of the uh, big matchup in the shoe last night. Um, pretty happy. I'm not going to lie to you. Made me happy. Uh, I was a little nervous before the game and throughout the game, but uh, we'll get into that pretty heavy. But I, I want to talk first about kind of who surprised you, uh, or maybe not who surprised you, but who uh, impressed you the most. James, which team you saw that you watched yesterday uh, kind of stood out to you and came to play in week one uh, in a big way? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of them. And I'm trying to say people that are going above expectation. But there were a couple games late that really impressed me. Um, I, I look at Washington going up against Kent State. And Kent State is a high-powered offense for the MAC. And Michael Penix and Kalen DeBoer, I, I've been a big fan of Kalen DeBoer way back when he used to coach at University of Sioux Falls, NAIA football, where he lost I think, like three or four games total during his time there. And he's got that program humming. I mean, for an offense that was like lethargic last year, I mean, you look at the numbers last night that Penix threw up. I mean, they were incredible. Uh, he looks like Washington is back in business and they're going to be playing for a bowl game this year. I mean, here, let me get down to the stats. I just had it up and then somehow clicked it off. 26 of 39 for 345, four touchdowns. And he was running like a maniac, too. I mean, he they looked impressive last night in a 45 to 20 win. I mean, they kind of took their foot off the gas in the second half. But I, I was impressed. I was really impressed. Did you get a chance to see them play at all last night? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got to be honest, I wasn't, I was impressed with them because I wasn't really expecting that much. Exactly. I, I was uh, expecting that offense to take a little while to develop and they looked good. Yeah, no, I, I was impressed with them. And, you know, I, I like Penix. I, I think he brought some magic uh, to Indiana, uh, especially for that one year there in 2020. I mean, he was lights out and they went as far as he could carry him. And, uh, you know, he had that it factor for the Hoosiers. And then injuries kind of derailed uh, his career there where, you know, he had some injuries before that, too, which kind of delayed his start. But I like the kid. Uh, he's got the confidence. He's got the ability and kind of just needs the, the team around him to go with it. Uh, so I was impressed. But I, I've got to admit that the one team that really impressed me and that is kind of my uh, top performer, so to speak, in my mind, is is the Florida Gators. Um, yeah. I didn't give them much of a chance to win this game. I mean, I gave them a chance to win the game because they're playing at home, because they are Florida. They, they have a lot of talent on that team. But just the way that last year ended, um, I didn't expect a ton from them, I guess, in week one going against a, a top seven team in Utah. 
Um, don't get me wrong. I, I think, you know, that Florida still has talent. I like Coach Napier. I think he's going to do a pretty decent job there. But I didn't expect it to all happen so quickly, I guess. And, um, you know, uh, I, I was about to say his nickname, but Anthony Richardson, um, you know, he played. He played yesterday, and uh, he had uh, 274 total yards. He had three touchdowns. He did a little bit of it with his legs. Uh, he did a little bit of it with his arm. Uh, I, I was really impressed with Florida. You know, Utah had chances to win that game several times as me and you talked about, but it was like Florida made the plays when they had to. And, uh, that, that really impressed me. What, what did you think about Florida taking down number seven, Utah? You know, honestly, at the end of the day, do I think Utah is the better team? Yes, but you're right. A hundred percent. Florida executed when they need to execute most and Richardson is living up to the hype. And honestly, I should have put him a lot higher on my, uh, uh, looking back on it now, I'm, I should have put him a lot higher on my, uh, fantasy projections. I, I thought there was going to still be that malaise and you were going to have a culture problem based on what you saw last year from Mullen. And it looks like they snapped out of it. I mean, heck the first drive of the game before they fumbled, I mean, they were picking more than more than 10 yards a clip on a Utah defense that is pretty stout, especially in the front four, uh, front seven. Yeah, um, that that's what I'm talking about. I mean, the things fell apart bad last year under Dan Mullen. I mean, yeah. what the hell happened? I don't think we'll ever really fully know uh, what went down, but it, it fell apart and it was evident on the field um, and. I just couldn't really explain it. I mean, they looked pretty decent. What was it week two or week three against Alabama? And then the wheels just fell off. And that that led to their coach, Dan Mullen, getting fired and losing his job. So I, I don't know. I, I guess I just didn't expect them to play as well as they did on both sides of the ball uh, in week one against a, a pretty good opponent. And and that, you know, we, we both picked Utah to win yeah. the Pac-12 and, uh, you know, obviously and they, the still can. they still I mean, can, they still can, they still can. I mean, not a great it, it, start for the Pac-12. Is what yeah. I'm I mean, it, it's funny. There was a lot of teams yesterday that in, that surprised me. Uh, Arizona going into Snapdragon Stadium, opening up San Diego State's new stadium and really putting a whipping on. Them. I mean, yeah. they beat them by 18. And I mean, it, 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 they. Deloria looks way better at quarterback. There's an identity in in, in Tucson. I, I mean, heck, Oregon State with with Jonathan Smith doing up there. I mean, that program has. I've said for some time that Jonathan Smith is like a hidden gem out there, and somebody's going to snatch him up. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, th that was pretty impressive. Um, who, which, which player? to you kind of stood out which guy do you want to give some kudos to uh as far as you know kind of impacted in a big way in week one which guy do you want to talk about uh strangely enough uh there are two i'm going to talk about on the defense and special team side in possibly one of the ugliest football games i have ever watched in my entire life it was like watching a train wreck was the iowa south dakota state game wow. uh jack campbell is a phenomenal talent. He has increased his stock from last year, and he was already incredibly good. I, I mean, honestly, I I, I, I think it's going to be very tough to beat him for the butt kiss. I mean, when you win seven to three, and four of those points come from safeties, yeah, that's telling you something. I mean, it was an when's ugly. The game. When's the last time that happened? I know. That's what I was wondering. I mean, it was like I was waiting for just a big play to happen to kind of like end the monotony. And it just never happened because Iowa's offense was a train wreck. I mean, Tyler Lindebaum was, it, it's making me look at even higher at him because Iowa was getting blown off the ball by South yeah. Dakota state. When's the last time you've seen Iowa get blown off the ball by anybody? Uh, it's been a while. I mean, usually yeah. their, their offensive and defensive lines are usually pretty solid. Uh, all the way around. So, exactly. yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, the fact that they were able to pull out that game is is also amazing considering they their offense is just oh, it's not awesome. existent. It's not well, I mean, that punter had 10 punts, seven of which were inside the 10-yard line. I mean, 
if he's not your offensive MVP for a guy that plays special teams, I don't know what is. Yeah, when your punter is the MVP, that's that's not a good thing um, in any way, shape, or form. But uh, one guy that I did kind of want to give uh, some kudos out to as, as one of my impact players um, is a guy that no one's really talking about. And, you know, on, honestly, I've had questions about him, but he decided to come back. There was questions about him potentially transferring. Um, and, you know, I'm not really sure what to expect from the season uh, for him so far, but that's that's DTR, uh, the quarterback uh, from UCLA. Uh, he came out, I know they were only playing Bowling Green, but, you know, this is a dude who, who was, you know, a lot of people thought he was going to lose his job and, and be replaced uh, by Dylan Gabriel or, or a couple other guys, and he ended up keeping his job and really played well uh, in the first game putting a putting a beat down uh, to Bowling Green. He was throwing the ball through for almost 300 yards. He ran for almost 100 yards. Uh, he looked like the, you know, Dorian Thompson Robinson that we've seen, you know, in the good times. And so I don't know, you know, the Chip Kelly's been there now for what? This is year five? I think at least, yeah. I think it's year five. And, you know, I really expect him to have turned around uh, UCLA by now, but it, it, you know, it's a project, you know, UCLA has not been the same type of program that it used to be uh, back in the eighties and nineties and whether they'll ever get back. I don't know, but we saw signs of it last year. Me and you talked about the UCLA uh, LSU game where, you know, UCLA just dominated LSU at the line of scrimmage. Well, you know, LSU didn't have the type of year that people thought they were. So maybe that yeah. game wasn't that big of a deal. But I think Chip Kelly's got to get it done here this year or people are going to definitely start losing faith in him in, in Los Angeles and beyond. And if they're going to be moving to the Big Ten, uh, you know, they may be moving another coach in there if he can't get it done. And I, I thought that, you know, bringing DTR back and, and having him under center proved to be a pretty good job, uh, at least in game one, because he looked pretty solid yesterday. Well, I mean, you look at that game. At one point in the second quarter, Bowling Green was up 17-7. to And UCLA has never been a team that do – they're not comeback teams. I mean, you know, you go back to the Josh Rosen victory over Texas A&M where they came back at home. But since then, since Chip Kelly's been there, if they're not winning, they usually turtle up. And they came out and – went field goal, touchdown, touchdown, scored 17 points in the last 828 of this first half, yep. and then finished it off. They did not allow Bowling Green to go back in. And they, I mean, heck, when you can throw a, go on a 38 to nothing run, you're going to win games. And Robinson put, Thompson Robinson put that team on his shoulders, and he, he is out for a mission. They want to get that, that Pac-12 South title. I agree. And, and do they have a shot is my question. Do they I, have a I think chance? They do. I think they do. I think they do too. I, I think no one's really, as I mentioned, no one's really been talking about them. No one's talking about him. This guy's a veteran. He's played in a lot of college football games over the years. He's been there during the lows. He's been there during the whatever, I guess you can call them highs, but the highs for them uh, since, uh, you know, Chip Kelly's been back. He, he's been there for all of it. And, um, you know, I thought he looked good yesterday. And if they can play like that or similar to that, they've got a chance because the rest of the Pac-12 uh, looked like garbage. And and before we get into uh, what happened in the shoe last night, I do want to talk about um, the games uh, for some of the other top teams really quickly because they weren't really games. And I'm talking obviously about uh, the uh, Pac-12 versus SEC matchup, numero uno, Georgia versus Oregon. Uh, James, what the hell happened? What <laughs> I mean, is, is Oregon just that bad? I mean, I know they lost a lot of play. They were a good team last year. They won, what, 10-plus games. Uh, Mario Cristobal parlayed it into a ton of money going back to the U. Uh, but Dan Lanning, you know, coached a pretty good Georgia defense last year, maybe one of the best defenses of all time. Uh, and then he went and took the head coaching job at Oregon and got shellackled. Uh, by his old team, forty nine to three, and I honestly, I thought it was worse than that. Um, I did too. What, I mean, you could what the hell happened? What Georgia the hell happened? Took their foot off the gas. I mean, yeah. it, it it was it was a dumpster fire. And Bo Nix is, I mean, he always had problems against Georgia, but man, did he look bad? I mean, here's an idea, Bo. 
I mean, granted, I'm not a quarterback expert. I just did it at a Holiday Inn Express, but I know better <laughs> than better than just focusing on your primary receiver. I would maybe I don't know do some checkdowns because they were reading your eyes like they were reading a Dick and Chain book, and I mean. <laughs> It was it was awful. I mean, he looked horrendous, and he put the defense in bad situation after bad situation, and they got in quicksand, and things blew up on him. I mean, heck, they made Stetson Bennett look awesome. You yeah. could just see the confidence in Oregon's face. They looked dejected, playing a practical home game in uh, in in Atlanta for Georgia. Yeah. Um... You know, we keep saying like, "Oh, Stetson Bennett play." Is, is Stetson Bennett good? Because I'm starting to believe that he is. I, I'm thinking maybe all of my analysis of him in the past was wrong. I, I feel like he's good now. I mean, look well, at the national championship game. Look at this game last night. This guy is consistent, and you know, may not be the biggest, most athletic guy in the world, but he can run when he has to. He's he knows where to go with the ball. Uh, I feel like he's better than what we give him credit for. I, I think you're right. I think the stigma of him being a walk-on is something people just can't get beyond. They like they hear the word walk-on and they think he sucks. And there are plenty of guys who were walk-ons that became all Americans. Now, don't Baker Mayfield st- comes yeah, to mind. I, I mean, remember, I'm I'm not saying that Stetson Bennett is going to become an all-American that he's better than C.J. Stroud, but he managed a pretty god darn good game last night. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's he doesn't turn the ball over. He does the smart things. Do I think see him playing on Sundays? No, but there's plenty of quarterbacks who have won national championships, i.e., Craig Krenzel, who didn't have to freaking you know they, they didn't go out there and have to throw the ball for 400 yards and be the focal point of the offense. The job is don't turn the damn ball over because if you've got the ball, they can't score. And right. he he's. I mean, granted, I think Georgia's offense is going to have to carry a lot more of the load because I don't see them having the depth once. But you look at that schedule, Georgia's schedule is not that tough. I mean, they finally, I mean, probably the two toughest games will be cocktail party in Kentucky on the way out. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Uh, Kentucky didn't look that great either, uh, struggling against Miami of Ohio yesterday. But, you know, Stetson Bennett, we say, you know, he doesn't have to throw for 400 yards. Well, he almost did throw for 400 yards exactly. yesterday. I mean, that was a pretty amazing game. 25 of 31, 368, averaged almost 12 yards of completion, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, he ran the ball for a touchdown uh, when he had to, had a seven-yard touchdown run. Uh, he spread the ball out. I mean, there was, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven 10, 11, different receivers caught passes. Uh, I just got to admit that I'm starting to think that maybe I was wrong about him. Uh, he can get it done, and he's, he's proving that he can get it done against some of the better teams. Oregon, I don't think, is a good team. I, I said it from the beginning. They're going to go as far as whoever plays quarterback goes. I didn't think Bo Nix was a good fit there. I don't like Bo Nix anywhere. As a lot of people said on Twitter last night, uh, Bo Nix is back just like he never left uh, because he looked – pretty much the same as he did in a lot of the ugly uh, Auburn games last year. And, you know, I think moving on from him is a good thing for Auburn because he he looked like garbage in a new uniform last night. And uh, wow. I, I didn't, I, I expected Georgia to win. Uh, honestly, I, I, expected I did too. Win. I expect them to win by two touchdowns, but I didn't expect a 49 to three bloodletting, uh, which is what we saw. No, I so, agree. Um, but anyway, so Georgia's not, everyone thought, you know, this is going to be a rebuild year for Georgia or maybe not a rebuild year, but they lost so many guys. Surely they can't be as good. We'll find out soon enough, but they looked pretty good in the, in the opener. Same thing with, uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide, another year, another Nick Saban team, uh, looking just about the same. Um, they looked sharp. I mean, they execute, but when do they not execute? I mean, it's it's getting I, so monotonous. Yeah. Not? I mean, this quarterback uh, threw for, what, six, five touchdowns. I think he ran for one, two. Um, didn't play much in the second half. 18 of 28, 195 yards, five TDs. Um, he also ran for 100 yards. Um, 
I, I don't know, man. I mean, this 55 to nothing against Utah State, who already had a win, uh, did you get to see Bama at all? And, and what did you think about them in the first A little bit, that? but it was as predicted. You know, it's Bama being Bama. I mean, granted, Utah State has not looked good. I mean, remember they hung on and had to pull away from UConn last week at home? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. granted, it, it's early in the year. Everybody's knocking the rust off. Uh, and it, I, I mean, but Bama is going to be Bama. Let's be honest. Did, was there a question mark that they wouldn't be in the playoff? I mean, the only way I think they could have problems is if Bryce Young gets hurt. That's yeah. it. If Bryce yeah. Young gets hurt, then we have to have another conversation. But until then, I mean, you got to put Bama in the conversation. That they'll be playing in the final four. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, yesterday Utah State used three quarterbacks. Uh, the three quarterbacks combined were eight of 22 for 57 yards. Um, you know, I think this defense is going to be better this year. I, I Last year at times the defense didn't look like a um, Alabama defense does most of the time. But, you know, they looked like it yesterday. And, you know, they've got Dallas Turner and they've got Will Anderson Jr., um, you know, Jordan Battle is back. Malachi Moore is back. Uh, they've still got Henry Toto. So, you know, the, they've got the stars there and they've got the young guys. This defense looked amazing yesterday. And I know it's Utah State, but uh, they look like they are back to where they were a couple of years ago. So it's going to be another year of uh, watching Nick Saban dominate college football. What, what the hell else is new? You know? Well, I mean, the sun rises east and sets in the west until he retires. Bama's going to be Bama. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Uh, it's just ridiculous and uh, almost unbelievable how he can continue to do this uh, over and over again. I, I mean, I know everybody talks about it, but I don't even think they talk about it enough uh, because they're the dynasty, the dominance is just it's never ending. And you would think at some point, one year, one game at one time, you know, the team would have a letdown or the team wouldn't be as good one year as it, as it was the year before. But with the way he recruits and the way he recoach, uh, the way he coaches, the way he develops, it just is it's nonstop. And uh, it's pretty, pretty freaking amazing. Um, we're going to be having uh, Mr. Quarterback Bill Sorry joining us here in just a moment. Um, but why don't we go ahead and talk about our uh, our initial thoughts of the game last night? Um as I mentioned before, I was a little bit nervous before the game. I, I don't understand. This is something that, that me and you talked about and that I want to talk about for a moment. You know, why if a team is ranked number five in the preseason and, you know, is supposed to be a top five team and are just playing a number two team, you got a top five matchup, why is the spread 17 and a half? I, I, I never understood that. I didn't think that this game was going to be a 20-point blowout and uh, certainly not when Jackson Smith and Jigba got hurt on the third play of the game uh, when the Buckeyes were on offense. But, you know, I thought that this was a, a really, you know, good game. I, I felt like if you give, um, you know, a defensive minded coach like Marcus Freeman months to prepare for a team that he's going to come up with a plan. And he did. Um, and, you know, it worked. It worked for three quarters. But, uh, you know, eventually. The Buckeyes' uh, offensive line started to wear, I think, the defensive line out for Notre Dame a little bit, started to run the ball on them a little bit more. I'm yeah. not sure why they didn't run the ball more throughout the game, uh, but, you know, whatever. They This game was close, and it was closer than the score indicated, and I, I thought, like, I felt like it was going to be a close game. Why, James, tell me your opinion. Why was the spread 17 and a half when you had two top five teams? Well, rule one, you know, somebody's got to be ranked four, five, six, seven. It's not like you could rank him one, two, three, and then next one up is 21. So, I mean, someone's got to be in that spot. Now, do I think there is a cliff from three to four to five? Yes, I think there's a huge cliff. And the top three teams are the three teams everybody's been talking about making the playoff. And I think from a talent perspective, when you look at that on paper, yeah, Ohio State's got more talent. Uh now, do I think that Marcus Freeman did a phenomenal job last night preparing for that game? Absolutely. I mean, how many times do you hear people say they drop eight? All the time, you know, when they're going up against passing teams. There were times last night where Notre Dame dropped nine and ten. I mean, 
they were going to take that away, especially when Jackson Smith and Jigman, because one of the big downsides people have been talking about Ryan Day for some time is that he does throw the ball too much. Yeah. And he made this big plea about how he was going to show his will and play Big Ten football. I mean, he did have 35 carries last night for 172 yards. It, but it really didn't look truly impressive until, he, like you said, in that fourth quarter. And Mayan Williams, I think, is a real hidden gem in that Ohio State system. I mean, Travion Henderson is unbelievably fast. But Williams gets you those ugly yards and he helped that team down the stretch to ice it overall. But, heck, look at that defense. I mean, look at the defense when he saw them play Minnesota at the opening game last year versus yesterday. Last year, it was a lot of base stuff where their linebackers were not hitting gaps. And Mo Ibrahim was having a field day. Today, I mean, heck, Notre Dame is known for the running. And they went 30 for 76 for 2.5 a carry. When Notre Dame goes 2.5 a carry – they lose. Yeah, there's no doubt. And um, it was a completely, completely different defense. I mean, let's talk about, um, you know, the second half, Ohio State gave up 72 total yards. And this is when, you know, Notre Dame started to mix up their play calling a little bit. They were doing everything they could uh, to try and get points, to try and get down the field. They really opened it up. And, you know, let's be honest, they're uh, Buckner looked pretty good considering that was his first yes. ever start. Uh, he began the game eight of eight. I thought that play call on the first play was amazing. Uh, it just worked out perfectly for them. They got a 54 yard gain because, uh, you know, Knowles had a corner blitz called and they had a quick, you know, out pass to the receiver that the corner was blitzing on. So it, it worked out phenomenally. And, um, you know, I, I was really impressed by what the, uh, you know, kid did in his first ever start from Notre Dame on a big stage in the horseshoe with 100,000 people yelling against him. I, I was very impressed with that. But at the same time, you've got to give Jim Knowles credit. I mean, this was a completely different defense than what we saw yesterday. They were mixing up coverages. Uh, they were mixing up fronts. You really didn't know what, what they were doing. You, I mean, until the play was run, you didn't know what this defense was going to do. You didn't know what kind of coverage they were in. You didn't know uh, who was coming, if they were blitzing. I, I just thought it was uh, night and day between what Coach Kerry Coombs uh, was putting together last year and, and what was put together this year. Um, I couldn't have been happier uh, with the way that that the defense played. Uh, the linebacker, you know, the linebacker group, as, as we'll talk to Steve here in a minute about, you know, it's been a real sore spot of this team. And I thought it was a strength yesterday. Steve Chambers, uh, Cody Simon, Eichenberg, I thought played out of his mind. Uh, it was just a complete, complete night and day difference. Um, well, not only that, Hall was year. getting penetration off the defensive line, too, as well. I thought oh he played one hell of a game. Oh, Hall, I mean, Mike, oh, Michael Hall was the best player on the field, in my opinion. Oh, uh, yeah. Night from start to finish. I mean, but the one thing I was going to, I was questioning on for this defense was remember that Knowles was at Oklahoma State for four years. And those yep. early years, the defenses were not that great. And it took time for them to develop and understand what he wanted to do and look at what they were last year. I mean, they were a, for a Big 12, they were rock solid. Yeah. For, no, for a league that likes to throw out points like it's a video game. Yeah, there's no doubt. All right, hang on one sec. I'm going to um, bring somebody else into this conversation here. Absolutely. Uh, let's see what we got to say. Hey, hey. Hey, Steve, how you doing today, buddy? I'm good. How about you? Uh, we're doing real good. Uh, we are uh, just diving into this game last night. I, I've, got a, I've got an opening question for you. Uh, right. You're coming out. You're the quarterback of the Buckeyes. You've got a huge game. Uh, everybody's watching. You know, top five matchup and your best, most talented, the, the best wide receiver in the country goes down with an injury, uh, you know, on his first catch. What the hell do you do after that? I mean, you've already got enough pressure on you. Just talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, C.J. Stroud last night. I mean, it wasn't his best game, obviously, but, you know, there's a lot of young, uh, new players out there for the team. Uh, just tell us, you know, give us your thoughts on, you know, what kind of pressure he was dealing with and and what you thought of the game of him, from him last night. Yeah, I mean, obviously coming off of the season he had and then coming into a marquee game like that, you're going to feel a lot of pressure. But I think he did well. I mean, here's the reality. Notre Dame's a good football team, right? Yeah. You yeah. saw the Marcus Freeman and their defense 
one wasn't a surprise. I mean, he's yeah. been doing that throughout his whole career. And hey, they knew the recipe that they had to do to win, and it wasn't going to be through the air, right? Marcus made it really clear in the beginning. Like, right? think about it. We didn't have what a couple pass plays over 20, 30 yards, right? And that's not normal for us. We didn't attack the ball downfield because we couldn't. Right. They were coached up and did a really good job. So, you know, if you take a step back and look at the film and realize what we did, I thought we had a really good game plan and, you know, adjusted with the injury, right? You mm-hmm. saw people step up in the receiving group that they should have. And, you know, our top two receiver or our top two running backs averaged six yards a carry. So all in, I think, in a pretty good offensive game, you know, up against a really good defense. I I agree. Do you start to think that you're gonna see Big Ten teams? are going to basically look at that Notre Dame game as their boilerplate of how they're going to defend Ohio State moving forward? And then what does Ryan Day do in the meantime? Does he just rely more on that running game and try to get 35, 40 carries a game? Yeah, I mean, I think both of those will work, right? But the reality is over the season, you'll have injuries and people evolve. And let's be clear, the corners and the the DBs that we're going to face aren't going to match up the same way that Notre Dame did, right? They had two yeah. really big physical guys out there that – could run with Marvin Harrison and, you know, the likes of Smith and Jigba. So the boilerplate's really good because Freeman can coach it and knows it really well. Whether you have the personnel to run it is the, the next question, right? So I don't see how teams can match up going into the season like that against us just because I don't think they have the personnel. But, I mean, it's a good plan. But if we can run the ball 35 times a game and still average six carries, who's going to beat us? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, heck, you're getting back to old school Cooper and uh, – and, uh, Oh, uh, oh, why am I drawing a mind? Trussle ball. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes, trussle ball. Yes. Yeah. No, and that, and that's, you know, I was saying this uh, at the beginning of the game was they were playing that type of coverage early and they were mm-hmm. really trying to take o- take away any of the deep stuff, um, keep everybody in front of them. And I felt like they should have ran the ball more at the beginning of the game. I'm not criticizing Ryan Day. He's a he's a very good play caller. He's, a, he's an unbelievable coach. Uh, he knows more about football than I will ever know. Mm-hmm. But I just feel like, I don't know, I felt like they went away from the run a little bit and tried to force the pass maybe too much. Am I am I nuts thinking that? Well, I mean, I think they had a game plan to get the ball out there, right? And then when your top receiver gets hurt, you're trying to adjust and put different people in. So, I mean, they were making it up, not making it up as they went, but they had to adjust, right, because of that right. big hole in their offense. But the reality is you want to get a guy like CJ Stroud momentum. I think they did that. Um, you know, we really didn't take any shots down the field because I don't think we had to, and it wasn't going to be there. So, you know, I have a feeling our offense is going to be just fine. Coming out of that game, oh, I don't yeah. really have no worries, right? I mean, our biggest question was how are we going to show up on defense? Um, you know, we had some dumb penalties that obviously made the game a lot closer than I think it should have been. Yeah. But, I mean, Notre Dame's a good football team, and yeah. we went out and played well, so. Yeah. I mean, sitting there saying, I mean, it, it looks, we just talked about this before you came on, of how there is a night and day difference between what Kerry Coombs did last year in that opening game against Minnesota and what you saw last night from Jim Knowles, where everything was so base and the linebackers were out, you know, were never hitting their gap to yesterday was, you know, pick your blitz. And sure. you every you'd line up a certain way and the quarterback, Buckner, didn't know heads or tails where anything was coming from. I mean, I, I, from your perspective, you know, how how do you prepare for something like that? I mean, you know, you're going to get a lot of different looks. I mean, you, if you look at the stat line, you know, in the passing game for Notre Dame, they had what five catches over 25 yards. Yeah, yeah. they didn't really do anything to pick us apart. Now they had some big plays, which on the back end, you want to make sure you're getting covered. But that's what's going to happen when you see those type of zone blitzes. You're going to see people either miss some tackles or break some plays like that. And we got to be able to recover, which we did. But if we can continue to get pressure with four without having to do some of those zone blitzes, that's when we get really dangerous because then yeah. we're able to keep on coverage and, you know, really mix it up, which I think we're going to get there. I mean, the linebacker play was the best I've seen in a while, right? You had guys coming downhill and they're good run fits. Um, you know, if you notice something, our tackling was way better last night than it's been an opening game. Oh, infinitely right? better. And guys were coming downhill and you, we saw running backs going backwards versus falling forward all the time, which... That's, I mean, that's a good indication of where we're going to go. Yeah, I, I was very impressed with the linebacker play. Me and James were talking about that just right before you joined us. I mean, I thought Steele played good. I thought that Eichenberg uh, played out of his mind. I thought that uh, Simon even played well. And I thought that the linebacker position was a strength for us last night as opposed to a weakness, which it has been in the past. I mean, all in all, 
Notre Dame had 30 carries uh, for 76 yards uh, right. rushing. I mean, I, I think that's pretty damn good. And uh, to be honest, we were just saying that, that Michael Hall uh, was the best player that we saw, you know, consistently throughout that game. Uh, uh, that guy was a, a monster. But, you know, I still didn't see the type of pressure that I think it's going to take for this Ohio State team to, to win the national championship. I think they're going to have to have – somebody break out. I don't know whether it's JT Talmud. I don't know whether it's Jack Sawyer. I don't know whether Harrison finally does it. Somebody's going to have to get home and start getting to the quarterback. Talk to me a little bit about what you saw out of uh, those three guys and what you see from them going forward. Yeah. So you notice a lot of their big plays were on, you know, early rundowns with some of our zone blitzes from a run perspective. And that's why they got those big passes. But what we were three for 13 on third down, like we got off the field on third down, which, Oh yeah. And years past, that wasn't the case. So yeah, look at how we were getting pressure. You know, could we always want to see more? Yeah. But, I mean, I look at what 51 did and how they played yesterday on third down. That's a good indication of where we're trying to go. So yeah. I think it's more of a scheme thing than anything. And, you know, we were in a position to drop and get zone coverage on a freshman quarterback. Let's try to drop many people and confuse them versus trying to blitz them and let them get away with a big play. So, I think our scheme worked really well against that guy, and we'll see what happens in the future. But our our front seven looked really good yesterday. Yeah, I agree. What other games did you watch this weekend, and what impressed you and depressed you the most? Yeah, I mean, I had a chance to watch Minnesota play on Thursday night. Um, I think, you know, with Ibrahim back, he's a good running back. They're going to be good on the west side of that conference. Um, You know, Penn State-Purdue was a hell of a football game. Oh, yeah. It's going to be, you know – Obviously, they got a good quarterback that made some big plays down the stretch there. And anytime Penn State's good, it's good for the conference. So we've seen a lot of a lot of really good things. Most impressive was what Georgia did to Oregon. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I forget how many yards rushing they had, but that was just that was a pretty physical, dominating game. And Oregon's a good football team, right? I know first coach and all that stuff, but Georgia looked really good. So it'll be fun to watch the rest of the year. I know that much. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a pretty cool. We we were just talking about how we love this uh, this opening weekend. You know, you got games starting Thursday night, you got Friday, you got Saturday, you got Sunday, you got Monday. I mean, for a crazy person uh, like us, it, it's pretty cool. And I thought last night, you know, I thought it re- I thought the game really delivered. I mean, I thought Notre Dame came in with a great plan. I thought they executed well. Um, you know, obviously Ohio State has more talent overall, but the game was close and I thought it would be close. I thought that 17 and a half point spread uh, was honestly a little bit ridiculous when you're calling Notre Dame a top five team. What did you think of uh, the game, you know, before it happened, seeing that, that 17 and a half point number uh, on it? Yeah. Well, those guys in Vegas are good at setting odds for a reason. Um, They knew that uh, the Ohio State faithful was going to take that bet. Yeah. Notre Dame's a good football team, right? Yeah. So 17 and a half, like, I never thought that was even possible. I, the game went about exactly as I expected. Right? It was physical, right? They were going to challenge us. We had to come up to play, and we did. Um, and that showed up in the stat line, but we still won pretty handily, right? We looked good. We closed it out when we had to. Second half, we had to run the ball. We established that, and uh, we played really good defense, right? We didn't give up any points in the second half, so... I, I don't know what else we could have done differently. That's how that game was supposed to live up to it. And I didn't see that being a track meet at all, especially with Coach Freeman and his background on defense. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing how now you played with Marcus in college, right? Or is he? Yeah. I he mean, just it was, a bit after me, but I know him very well. He, like they kept talking about how cerebral he was during the pregame. Like, what was he like back when he was in college ball? Well, like that made you have that spark that you know maybe he could coach or he had that leadership qualities that you saw yeah i mean you you know what i'm seeing out of him now as the head coach is what you saw in him as a player right he approached it the same way he knew they were going to put in the work and after that they were going to let everything you know leave it out on the field that's how marcus is right he's watching the game he's making adjustments go look at his whole coaching career and i think he learned that when he was playing at ohio state right there's you know they're going to come out and they're going to have a scheme and they're going to do well but what do you adjust and how do you keep pressure on? And that's what Marcus does really well, right? Think about it. They did a good job getting pressure on us last night. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing some schemes to, to make it challenging. We took away, they took away our number one receiver, right? And knocked him out. So, I mean, they did a really good job on defense, but we still established six yards of carry in, in the rush, which if we continue to do that. We're going to win a lot of football games. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, it should be it should be nice to see what happens moving forward. Um, honestly, the um, you know receiving core I thought played pretty well. I mean, I, they're getting some some heat, uh, but honestly, I thought they stepped up pretty good. I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr. had five catches for fifty six yards. No one's really giving him credit for that, but he did. And you know, Ibuka. Uh, really stepped up and had nine catches for 90 yards in the touchdown, considering he became kind of the number one guy after uh, Jackson Smith and Jigbo, you know, went out. Talk to me, uh, Steve, just a little bit about, you know, moving forward the rest of the season. What do you expect based on the schedule uh, from this team? And um, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, the offense moving forward and, and what will they look like, uh, you know, against the opponents coming up? Well, if you think about it, if uh, Harrison Jr. completes that catch on that one long touchdown pass, right, he yeah. just dropped it, right? Everyone has a totally different story on the stat line from a passing yeah. perspective. So just file that away and keep that in. I mean, teams are going to have to pick how they want us to beat them. Are you going to give up the pass and put people in the box, or are you going to do what Notre Dame did, right? They tried to stay in zone, tried to get away, you know, cover our receivers, which allowed us to get six yards of carry. You're going to have to pick one or the other. And if both of our running backs are running like that, what do you do, right? So uh, the sky's the limit with this offense and where we want to go. Um, you know, the question I would have for our fans, if you look at the season, do you want to win a national championship or get C.J. Stroud the, the Heisman Trophy? I'd rather win a national championship and win games the way we did last night um, in a solid fashion just because he only had 200, what, 50 yards passing. Um, yeah. Still had a great stat line and a good game, right? So we keep winning games like that, we're going to be in a good spot. Yeah. He had no picks too. You know, I mean, he, he didn't, he didn't hang on to the ball too long and get, get popped and fumble it. He didn't uh, have an interception. I mean, that to me uh, was re what really stood out was he didn't make any huge mistakes. I mean, it, it wasn't perfect. It was game one. He had a lot of pressure on him coming in. His mm -hmm. best uh, receiver went out, but, but he, he just kept on plugging. And so uh, I, I like that last question for me, uh, Steve was, I, I got to admit, I was impressed with this Buckner kid who never started a game in his Notre Dame career coming into the shoe and starting out eight for eight. Uh, just tell me what you thought about him uh, coming out in his first start and what you think it was like for him uh, playing in the horseshoe for his first start ever in the season opener. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he'll try to downplay it, but that's, that's pretty impressive what he did. He came out and he played really well. I think, um, you know, his, his big guy, his big tight end made a couple of really big plays for him. Yeah. But the reality is he, from a blitz recognition and just putting himself in the position to make those plays, he did a really good job. And that's probably the part to me that was the most impressive. I mean, we threw a lot of different early looks at him that he handled pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hence the first play of the game, right? We came out with a nice run blitz. He threw right into the teeth of it, made a big play. So um, if that's what they're going to get from him for the rest of the year, Notre Dame's a, you know, they're a top 10 football team, easy, top five, right? I mean, they're going to win a lot of football, so. One last question for me is yeah. always going into the first game of the year. I mean, you've had 250 some odd days of playing, you know, working out with your guys, practicing. You haven't faced anybody. It's not like the NFL where there's preseason games. We get that or, or scrimmages against somebody else. Mm -hmm. What's your headspace as a quarterback going in, even if you're playing Notre Dame or at home against Toledo? Like, what's going through your head in those days and weeks coming up to that first game when you're coming through the tunnel out into the field? Like, is it butterflies? Is it like, what What are you going through the, to prepare yourself for that game? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always butterflies. Those guys, we don't want to admit it, right? We're superhuman. But the reality is, yeah, you want to go out and you want to execute, and especially, you know, coming after a year, right? You, you know, think about it. Last year, CJ Stroud put out a hell of a year. Now he's going out putting on his own pressure on top of everything else. But the reality is you want to establish identity and be efficient. And if you look at what we did last night, I mean, they were efficient with football, right? We had no yeah. turnover to your point. Um, we did pretty well on third downs, right? We got a, got a good chunk of first downs. We ran the ball well. And, you know, when we had to throw the ball, we did, right? And we didn't take any big shots. We didn't do anything to really out scheme them. We knew we had to play a solid, efficient game, and we did that. And that, that's what you want to see out of your quarterback, a veteran quarterback coming out and managing the game. And he did that really well. Awesome. Steve, man, thank you so much for coming on with us today. Uh, I loved your breakdown as, as always and uh, loved uh, hearing your thoughts as uh, it was pretty great, great season opener. I mean, they had they, the top two top two top five teams 
uh, I expected a good game, and that's what we got. So uh, hopefully the the season, like you said, will look like this uh, going forward, and that defense will just keep you know keep getting better uh, as we go along. So hopefully we can come, uh, bring you back and and have you on uh, later on the year after a couple more games if if you got time, buddy. Well, love hey, you, man. Appreciate it. Happy birthday to your little guy too, as well. It was last Thank week, you. right? Yeah, last week turned eleven. So nice. Oh yeah, we're knee deep in football, so it's a lot of fun right now. Nice, awesome. nice, awesome, man. Enjoy it and uh, stay in touch with us. We'll uh, we'll have you on whenever you got time. Okay, bye. You got it, man. Appreciate it. All right, thanks, Steve. Have a good one, bye. Bye. Man, uh, that was awesome. Always love hearing from a guy who did it and started at quarterback for the Ohio State Buckeyes. I love uh, Steve's takes. He always breaks it down and 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 shoots it straight. Uh, I don't know if you saw this uh, stat line here below, but since 1998, Notre Dame is now three and 22 versus top five teams. You, uh, you could say since Lou Holtz and just make it more specific, you know. Hey, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> repeating the stat line. I mean, um, you know, it's a fact. I mean, they, they don't necessarily play great against top five competition. You know, people want to say it's because uh, that, you know, they, they don't have the same type of talent that they, um, you know, just aren't aren't as good. Uh, I don't really know the answer as to why that record is what it is. But, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. I mean, what games are you looking forward to next week? Um, I don't know. I haven't really looked into those yet, but we do have a question here uh, for you, James. What do you think went wrong in the first half? Um, I'm going to give my quick answer, and then I'll let you answer that, James. Uh, question from Adam Whiting White uh, from Columbus. Uh, you know, my my thing is, I don't think anything really went particularly wrong. I think Notre Dame did a good job. Uh, they had a great game plan. I think Jack, the, the if I can say one thing that went wrong was Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, getting hurt. I mean, you can say it's just one guy, but uh, the dude uh, – the dude is the best wide receiver in the country for a reason yeah. and losing him uh, as well as losing your two best wide receivers from last year in Chris Olave and uh, you know, Garrett Wilson losing basically all three of those guys right away uh, you know, was an eye opening experience and, and caused the, the game plan to have to shift. So that's kind of what I think happened. Um, but I also think that the defense came to play and, and the scheme was good. What did you think James? Well, I mean, uh, Notre Dame's whole game plan was to keep everything in front of them. I mean, they were not going to get beat one bit. And I, honestly, you know, I, I, I think people have got to, like, they're so used to last year Ohio State throwing up 40 points and playing video game football. And quite frankly, a 21-10 to 10 win is just as good as a 31-20 to 20 win. I mean, just it's just because you have more offense doesn't mean better football. And quite frankly, it's the first game of the year. Let them knock off some rust and see what happens. There's a lot of football yet to be played. And trust me, there are teams. Look back at the 2014 Buckeyes. I mean, remember, they lost to Virginia Tech at home and still went on to win the national title that year. So just because things happen early doesn't mean you want to catch. You want to get hot late. You don't want to get hot now and then lose steam. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And, um, you know, I, I think, honestly, it was just these are two good teams. And, yeah. you know, they were taking away the deep stuff. And so that's why the stats looked the way they did. That's why the first half looked the way it did uh, was because that's how, you know, they wanted it to look. They didn't want to. They were going to let us take the underneath stuff and. Uh, they were going to try and take away all the deep stuff. So that's that's kind of what went down. Um, but, you know, just digging into some of these other games really quick, I wanted to hit on, uh, before we get out of here, because we're running out of time, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the NC State uh, game. I watched the <laughs> NC State East Carolina game uh, from start to finish, and I have to be honest, uh, East Carolina looked like the better team. And I'm not saying that NC State sucks. I'm not saying that they're not good, um, but they got pushed around a little bit by East Carolina, and East Carolina owned that second half. If that guy doesn't miss the extra point, A, the game's tied and it goes to overtime, and B, if he doesn't miss the uh, – I don't know exactly what it was. I think it was like 38-yard field goal, maybe maybe 40 at the most. But he, he, he missed an extra point and then missed a makeable field goal 
uh, that he still had to win the game. Is is NC State bad, or or what happened? Do you think uh, in that game yesterday where where they definitely should have lost? Well, I mean, East Carolina is a solid program. I mean, I, I think that people don't under are, are really discounting them because. East Carolina has been down for quite some time since Ruffin McNeil and heck people forget it. Lincoln Riley was the OC there back when Ruffin McNeil was the coach. Um, Mike Houston's been building this program up and I mean, a name to keep on people's lips is Holton Eilers, the quarterback. I mean, there's a reason why you see the guys like Phil Steele talking him up, the NFL draft guys. I mean, this is a guy that could have gone to many other programs and chose to stay home. He went to D.H. Conley High School in Greenville. He stayed home to play for East Carolina. And you got to take your hat off to a guy like that who's willing to help rebuild that program. I mean, heck, this is a guy who had offers from Florida from Georgia, from Indiana, from Minnesota, NC State, Oregon State. I mean, the list goes on and on, but he stayed home and they really built that program well. I mean, NC State's going to be a quality team. That defense is rock solid. And as usual, Doran's got a strong offensive line and Devin Leary's good. But I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, the little things matter. And that missed extra point was the difference between Heck, taking playing for a little bit more time and seeing if you could pull it off at home in an, in an electric crowd. The Boneyard was electric yesterday. It was electric, and I like uh, Coach Houston. I mean, that guy, we talked about him uh, off air yesterday. He, he won yeah. a national championship at James Madison. He he uh, played for a second one. So this is a guy that was basically a multiple uh, national championship type guy in, in the lower levels and uh, looked, like, looked like he knew what the hell he was doing uh, yesterday, he had a hell of a game plan and really, really played well uh, for the East Carolina Pirates. So I'm going to give them credit. The other game that I wanted to talk to you about uh, was the Arkansas-Cincinnati game. It's a game that I thought would be pretty good. Two uh, ranked teams, number 19 Arkansas versus number 23 Cincinnati. Obviously, Cincinnati lost a lot. Uh, they lost their quarterback. They lost their running back. Uh, they lost at least one, maybe two of their good receivers. They lost a lot on defense. But, you know, still Coach Fickle is there. Uh, he, he brought in a quarterback who's been in his system for quite some time. I thought Cincinnati played really good in the second half. Uh, they scored all 24 points in the second half. But K.J. Jefferson, guy we weren't sure about, he looked really good. He, 18 of 26, 223 yards, three touchdown passes. And then he ran for a touchdown as well um, and had 62 yards on the ground. What did you think about Arkansas, Cincinnati, and what is your take on those two teams after week one? You know, Arkansas, I, I, I KJ Jefferson, I was worried that when they lost Traylon Burks, they were going to see a downgrade. But I think he's really matured in this game. I mean, people forget how big this guy truly is. He's 6'3", 240 pounds, and he's got speed. So you're really looking a guy like Tim Tebow style of running back. I mean, you're, I mean, quarterback, he, he can run, he can throw. I still am wondering, I mean, you lost a lot on that since they lost a lot in their D backs and not having that strength, at corner, which they had last time, I think is hurt them because they don't, Arkansas didn't have that lights out receiver. I mean, they were hoping Jaden Hazelwood, the transfer from Oklahoma would step it up. He only had three catches for 42 yards and a touchdown yesterday. Um, my worry is KJ Jefferson's going to have to put too much on his back. And at some point that could hurt this team. Yeah. I, I thought that other kid, Trey Knox uh, looked really good. Uh, he looked fast. He caught the ball. Well, number seven, I think he had six catches for 75 yards and two touchdowns. So with maybe him with Hazelwood combined, they can kind of pick up the slack, uh, you know, lost from Burks moving on, but, you know, this was a, a good win for them at home against a quality opponent, I felt like. And they and they got them, you know, got their best shot in the second half. So, you know, I, I've talked to you about this at length. I like Coach Pittman. Uh, I talked to, you know, say whatever you want to about the guy. Since he's gotten, uh, you know, been there in Arkansas, this has been a different team. I mean, this yes. team was no good, uh, struggled mightily to even win game. I mean, they were winless in the SEC the year before he got there. And he stepped in and just installed, instilled his culture, uh, and it's it's really you know taken hold. And I, it looks like a different program uh, since he's been at the helm. So uh, I love that. Um, 
talk to me about the other games you want to talk about before we before we get I, out of here. I'm blown away when you brought up North Carolina that you didn't bring up a game in far western North Carolina in the city of Boone between North Carolina and App State. App State scored 40 points in the fourth quarter. I mean, that was like literally playing Tecmo Bowl of the 90s at the end. How much points were put on the board? Did you end up watching the end of that where a two-point conversion was the difference between taking that game to overtime at 63-63 and then they didn't make it? Yeah, they had a couple failed uh, couple failed two-point conversions uh, at the end there, or um, App State could have easily won that game. I'm, I'm not sure whether that game is more of an indictment on – App State or or UNC? I, I really think I, th- I think it may be UNC to be honest. I just I'm not sold on them. They they really underperformed last year, and honestly, I I felt like you know if they were going to do anything, it was probably last year with with Sam Howell at quarterback, who'd been there for years and was projected to lead them to a potential ACC title, and and, and things just never really materialized. And I, I feel like uh, this team may be going the wrong direction. Um, they definitely got lucky in that one, but um, the but, uh, the other games that that intrigued you were what? Oh, uh, the Minnesota game. I think Minnesota being New Mexico State, it, it not as I mean, you saw Mo Ibrahim getting back to being old school Mo Ibrahim. I questioned after his torn Achilles what he'd be like, but that defense, as much as they lost, look lights out. Uh, probably, de- I mean, there's. No stars on that defense, but, man, they know how to keep everything in front of them, and they attack the ball. Uh, One thing going back to that App State game, um, Chase Bryce, you know, the guy who's been on the Christian Leitner graduation plan, I mean, he's got to be like a doctor now since he's been in college for like 20 years. Had uh, 361 yards passing, six passing touchdowns, and one interception. When, when's this guy going to actually get a job and leave? And like, I mean, because it seems like what he's played for Clemson, Duke, App State. Is VMI in his future? Is James Madison? I mean, the guy's been around for freaking ever. He's pl- How many teams has he played for now? At least three. Clemson, Duke, and now App State. Yeah. I don't know, man, but he, he brought the pain yesterday and, and proved that uh, you know, he's, he's learned something at all those stops, but yeah, I mean, uh, we got another question here talking about the first games, uh, top teams were playing unranked teams, Ohio state playing number five team. Yeah. We, why do we've talked about that at length? Um, you know, you have teams like the team up North who opened against Colorado state is coming back with, uh, Hawaii and then UConn to start their season. And, and meanwhile, uh, you know, Ohio state opened up against Notre Dame. Honestly, I think it's good to go ahead and play somebody good. Um, I think it's a good, I think it was good for the Buckeyes really to get challenged like that uh, in the first week. And and these other teams, you know, you got to realize they're in the NFL, you got a preseason where you play three games that don't count and you yeah. can just basically, you know, see what guys are made of, figure out who's good, who's not good, uh, who's going to be the best uh, in that particular position to help your team. Uh, but in college football, you don't have that. And so some of these teams, like to uh, you know throw a, a tune-up game if you were uh, out there you know first and foremost, but but you know I, I get it. There were some of those, but there's actually for a week one lineup, there's been some good games. I mean Purdue, Penn State, for example, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, Ohio State, Notre Dame. I mean Georgia, Oregon, supposed to be good, uh, wasn't, but was supposed to be a good matchup. I mean there were there are some decent matchups, so um, you know. I, a lot of these teams got a got a warm up game, but some did not. And I, I on that point, I want to talk to you about the Penn State uh, Purdue game. I know we talked to Steve Belisari about it there for a minute, but I I don't know. I'm still not seeing what I want to see. I guess out of Sean Clifford, I, I you know for three quarters, I thought he looked pretty uh, pedestrian, honestly, and um, I thought they kind of got helped out, I wanted to say, to win that game. Um, you know, the the play calling was suspect in the end of the game for Purdue and Jeff Brom. Uh, there were some mistakes made uh, by the Purdue Boilermakers. Otherwise, I felt like they could have won that game. Um, what do you think? You think just because they won, Penn State's going to use it as a positive and move forward? Or what What did you take away from that, that Purdue-Penn State matchup? 
sometimes you're going to win ugly. I mean, let's be honest. You're going to win ugly. And it's not like, I mean, Sean Clifford is Sean Clifford. It's not like he's going to wake up one day and become Dan Marino. Yeah. You know, he, he, he has to, they, he, I mean, they, it, it, I, I, I he, he's never going to be that guy, kind of guy that's just going to be have that huge power arm. I mean, I think one thing Penn State's got to get a better job of is running the football. I mean, once again, they only had 30. I mean, their leading rusher only had 31 yards on the ground. Yeah. And they're going to have to throw the ball and rely on that defense. And Purdue is not a bad program. I mean, Aiden O'Connell is legit. I mean, 29 to 58 for 356. I mean, if you've watched any Purdue football over, I don't know, the last two and a half decades, you know they're going to throw the ball. It's the cradle of quarterbacks. The guy that really impressed me in that game was the Iowa transfer, Charlie Jones. He had only 21 catches last year in Iowa City. In one game, he had 12 catches for 153 yards and a touchdown. He really has shown his development as a kid who's transferred twice now and now playing in uh, in uh, um, West Lafayette. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the, the Big Ten looks like moving forward. As, as me and you talked about, I did pick Minnesota to finish a little higher than you did. I think they looked good week one. That doesn't mean that's how it's going to end up. Um, but I, I was impressed uh, with them week one. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, however, we've still got games this week. Yeah. We got we got the Clemson Tigers tonight. Uh, Clemson is playing Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, not good. Mm. But That's tomorrow night. Tonight's uh, LSU and Florida State. You're right. You're right. Today is Sunday. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, tonight is Sunday, September 4th. And is Florida State LSU, and then tomorrow is Clemson and Georgia Tech. So uh, the Clemson game tomorrow, I'm looking forward to to see what the Clemson offense looks like. I want to see. I know it's not a great team they're playing, but I want to see what the quarterback looks like. I want to see what the offensive line looks like. I want to see what those receivers look like. Uh, very intrigued with that one. And then uh, the game t- tonight, Florida State LSU. Uh, I think is a very, very interesting matchup. I mean, what what does Florida State have? Can they contend in the ACC? And then what is the the raging Cajun Brian Kelly uh, going to do down there in LSU with his Southern accent? Uh, what tell me what you're looking for in those two games, James? You know, I I don't know what to expect from LSU since there was so much transition and they brought so many new guys in. It's hard to see if those guys mesh and. You know, who's going to play quarterback? Is it going to be Jaden Daniels? Is it going to be Garrett Nussmeyer? I mean, we know it's not going to be Miles Brennan because he's got to work on his hunting game right now. So, um, personally, from what I saw last week from Florida State, I would pick the Knowles uh, to, to really? win tonight. Yeah, I would because I think there's too much unknown in LSU. I have I downgraded at the beginning of the year because, I mean, you're bringing in practically a, a new team. They've had so many guys come together. In in one fall, I mean, in 15 fall practices, can you bring those guys together to get ready to play a power five team? Yeah, I mean, I'm still taking the Tigers and, you know, everybody hates Brian Kelly and I get it. He, he's apparently uh, a dick, but, uh, you know, he's not being paid for his you know, friendship acumen. Uh, he's, being oh, yeah. paid, he's being paid for how he coaches football and the guy wins games. So I feel like he's going to have this team ready. I mean, let's be honest, even last year when LSU, you know, just underperformed immensely, they still had talent all over the place. I mean, Keyshawn yeah. Boutte is one of the best wide receivers in the country, in my opinion. Jaden Daniels, uh, like him or not, has put up numbers at Arizona State. I think he's going to start uh, in the game tonight. And, I would be surprised uh, if he doesn't, actually. Yeah, I think he's going to start. And if he doesn't play well, they'll they'll throw the other kid out there. But I think Jaden Daniels will do just enough uh, to win. I mean, let's be honest, Florida State has not been Florida State in, in the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, it just it hasn't been the same since Jimmy uh, uh, Jimbo Fisher left. And uh, it's been kind of a disaster, honestly, with the coaching carousel down there. Um, you know, I think Corbell – might be the answer. I don't know. They looked they looked okay in week one, but they were playing Duquesne. I mean, give me a break. All these people are like, oh, they've got a game under their belt. They, they ran for 400 yards. Well, hell, my high school team could run for 400 yards against Duquesne. So, yeah, uh, but it's more about execution. Are you not turning the ball over? Are you 
uh, not getting a lot of penalties. You know, I, I think people get when they w- play against the sister Marys of the deaf, dumb and blind, get more worried about the score. I'm looking more at turnovers and penalties, because if you're racking up penalties against them, you're going to rack up more penalties against harder competition. And it's just an execution problem. I agree. My only point is they're not going to run for 400 yards tonight. Oh, um, God, no. God, I no. think LSU's defensive line is, is going to be a problem for them. And, um, you know, LSU's always got good cover guys. They always have good linebackers. Um, there's just a big time talent pool in, in Louisiana. And, uh, you know, they still have some dudes on that team. And uh, I, I love uh, Keishon Boutte. I think he's a really, really talented receiver. He's the next guy, in my opinion, to come out of LSU and, and go to the NFL. Yeah. Uh, he, he will be the next guy. So hopefully somebody can throw him the ball because uh, if he if somebody can get it out there to him, he, he's going to catch it and he's going to run with it. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I thought it was a great week one, man. Um, I know there's some games we didn't get to, but I thought that, um, you know, it was a very exciting week one of football. Um, you know, Nebraska got finally got got a win uh, for your boys. Hey, Scott hey, Cross. hey, hey way, way to go. go. Hey, you know, taking on those those the Missouri Valleys of the world. That's great. You know, I wonder how they're going to do next week against uh, South Dakota State or you and I. I mean, I don't know, man. I, it, uh, does Scott Frost make it to the middle of October? That's the question. Well, the the question that that's going to be answered on, I believe it's September twenty fourth. I think when they play. Um, they play Oklahoma, so we'll see. They they beat North Dakota, and everybody's like, oh, they beat North Dakota. It's not North Dakota State. It's North yes. Dakota. There's a big difference. And, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they, they won 38-17, to 17, but still not really that impressive. It was 7-7 to 7 at halftime, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, in the third quarter, I believe it was 24-17. to 17. So yeah, they won 38 to 17, but it was 24 17 in the third quarter and was still the game was not, you know, still not uh, in doubt. And, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen down there, but I, I kind of feel like it's almost the end of Scott Frost. And, and another game in the Big Ten uh, was the Indiana Illinois game. Uh, you know, Illinois looked pretty good in week one, uh, got a victory, and then, um, you know, just didn't execute as well uh, in, in week. I guess week zero, week one, but uh, Connor Basilic threw for 330 yards. Uh, Chase Brown, uh, the running back for Illinois, still ran for 200 in the loss. Uh, but you know that was a big win for Indiana, in my opinion, especially with their schedule coming up. I feel like this was a good one uh, to to hopefully improve on that two and ten uh, season from last year. Definitely. So we'll see what happens, man. But uh, enjoy the games uh, tonight. And enjoy the game tomorrow, and we'll come back next week, and we will uh, break it down all over again. Hopefully have some some more guests uh, to come on and chat with us. But we really appreciate uh, former Ohio State quarterback Steve Belisari uh, joining us today and giving his thoughts. I mean, this is a guy who played quarterback at Ohio State. He played in the NFL. Uh, he knows a lot about uh, knows a lot about college football. He knows a lot about uh, you know what C.J. Stroud was facing out there. So it was good to get his thoughts on that game and um, get his uh, feedback on on what happened yesterday. Perfect. Well, same bat channel next week, right? Yes, sir. Thank you for your efforts. And thank you, Lord, for college football. Uh, It's great to have it back. Uh, We've we've been talking about it all offseason, which it's fun to talk about, you know, what we think is going to happen and who we think is going to be good, but man, it's so much more fun to actually watch it. Is it not? The, 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 the fans, the environment, if you can't get jacked up by this, there's nothing you can get jacked up by. It's we finally hit Nirvana again. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. It's uh, there's nothing better than just flipping back and forth through games and taping games and watching a great game. I mean, I, I sat there and watched the entire um, East Carolina NC State game, you know, in its entirety from start to finish. And I could have cared less who won. And I still had a fantastic time. So that's what college football is all about. Games like that, that can keep you interested, even when you don't even care who wins. Uh, that That's what's great about it to me. So uh, we'll, we'll have another great week next week. And we still got some games this week. So we'll get those 
uh, under their belt and talk to them and break everything down uh, like we do on here. All right. Perfect. All right, bud. Have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for your efforts and keep your chin up. You bet. All right, bud. Bye. Later.